good afternoon and welcome to the problems on chapter 21 this is dealing with direct current circuits and circuits containing a combination of resistances and capacitances so here we go we look at question number one and in this question we have what is the resistance of 10 275 ohm resistors connected first in series and then in parallel of course it's easy if resistors are connected in series you just add them up to get the total resistance so in series it's just going to be the sum of the resistances as you can see r1 plus r2 plus all the way up to those 10 of them which will give you 275 times 10 which is 2750 ohms but when it comes to parallel the reciprocal of the total resistance is equal to the sum of the reciprocals as you can see here so when we do that math we get 1 over 275 we got to do that 10 times right which will give 10 by 275 but when you reverse it on the left side you get rp by 1 which makes it 275 over 10 which gives 27.5 ohms and an 1800 watt toaster a 1400 watt electric frying pan and a 75 watt lamp all three are plugged into the same outlet in a 15 ampere 120 volt circuit and of course the devices are connected in parallel which means that each one of them get the same voltage because whenever devices are connected in parallel they all are connected individually to the same source which means they get the same voltage so the voltage available for each one of them is 120 volt and the question is what current is drawn by each device so power is the product of voltage and current and since the power is given for each one and we know the voltage current would be power divided by the voltage so the for the first one the toaster you get 1800 divided by 120 which is 15 ampere draws 15 ampere which is the maximum current available for the frying pan it's only 1400 watts so it draws a smaller current it's a 1400 divided by 120 gives 11.7 amperes likewise for the lamp only 75 watts so it's going to draw a very small current it's 0.63 ampere now in the b part will this combination blow the 15 ampere fuse is the question all right the toaster and the frying pan are you see together drawing more than 15 ampere so the toaster and the frying pan or the toaster and the lamp either combination will blow the fuse because the fuse rating is only 15 ampere that means any current more than 15 ampere is going to blow that fuse and since a combination of any two of these will always draw more than 15 ampere the fuse will be blown this is the third question this question talks about the car this question talks about the car with a 30 watt headlight and 2.40 kilowatt starter and are connected in parallel in a 12 volt system what power would one headlight and the starter consume if connected in series so they are actually connected in parallel but the question says what power would it have drawn if they were connected in series to the same 12 volt battery now when you do this you're given the power of each one and you're given the voltage but we need to figure out how much current each one draws in order to figure that out we could have used power is equal to voltage multiplied by current but it will not serve the purpose because ultimately when you connect them in series 
we need to know their resistances so that we can add their total resistance when they are in series. So the first thing is to find the individual resistance of each one of them. And for that we use the formula power is the square of the voltage by resistance. When you rearrange you get resistance is the square of the voltage by power. The voltage is 12.0, power is 30 watts so you get 4.80 ohms for the headlight and for the starter since its power is much bigger its resistance is going to be much smaller. So now when you connect them in series you know that the total resistance is the sum of them. So the total resistance happens to be 4.86 ohms. Now we know the resistance so we can use the power formula again which is V squared by R. Uh, now the resistance is the total resistance and that way we can figure out the power that they would consume is 29.6 watts. So that's the answer to this question. Definitely uh, this power is much smaller than what you would have required if both of them were connected in parallel as they should be. Here is the next question. In this question what is the terminal voltage of a large 1.54 volt carbon zinc dry cell used in a physics lab to supply 2 ampere to a circuit if the cell's internal resistance is 0 0.1 ohms. How much electrical power does the cell produce? And what power goes to its load? So the main issue tackled here is that every cell has an internal resistance. In this particular case the internal resistance is really small. It's uh, 0 0.1 ohms. Nevertheless uh, all the voltage of the cell will not be available to the load. So it's a 1.54 volt cell but because of the internal resistance a part of the voltage is going to be lost and the part that is lost is the product of the current flowing and the internal resistance. So we need to figure out the current that flows in the circuit when this is connected. It says the current is 2 amperes that makes it easier. So to do the A part the available voltage is the the voltage of the cell minus the drop or the lost. So the EMF of the cell is 1.54, the current is 2 and uh, the internal resistance is 0.1. So this is what is lost. So when you multiply this you get 2 times 0.1 which is a 0.2. 1.54 minus 0.2 is 1.34 volt. So the load only gets 1.34 volt. In the B part, how much electrical power does the cell produce? Power is the product of current and voltage. So it's uh, 2 times the actual voltage because the question is how much does it actually produce? So we get 3.08 watts which is the actual power that it produces but then the C part what power goes into the load that's going to be less. To find out the power that goes into the load you take the actual power minus the wasted power. The wasted power is I squared times R. I squared times R is the wasted power. So when you do that math you get 2.68 watts available to the load although the cell is uh, capable of producing 3.08 watts. And here is number 5. Distance of a flashlight bulb is 2.30 ohms and it is run by a 1.58 volt alkaline cell having a 0 0.100 ohm internal resistance. So 
The flashlight bulb has a resistance of 2.30 ohms and the cell used has a voltage 1.58 but it has an internal resistance of 0.1 ohms. We are asked to find the current that flows. By Ohm's law, the current that flows in a circuit is the voltage divided by the total resistance. So when you connect this uh, flashlight uh, to the cell, the resistance of the cell is going to come in series with that of the flashlight. So the total resistance is going to be 2.30 plus 0.1. And then when you divide the, the voltage by that total resistance, we get the current. So 1.58 divided by the total resistance in series gives us the current as 0.658 ampere. Next, we are asked to calculate the power supplied to the bulb and the formula is specified. Use I squared resistance of the bulb. So let's do that. Now we know the current. So square that and multiply with the resistance of the light bulb. And that gives 0 0.997 watts. The third part is, is this power the same as calculated using the other formula for power, voltage squared by resistance of the bulb? Let's find out. We know that the available voltage is what we're going to use. The available voltage is not 1.58, but it's 1.58 minus the lost voltage which is the product of the current and the internal resistance. Do not forget that. So when we, when we use that as the voltage which is the available voltage of course we get the same power. Here is question number six. The label on a portable radio recommends the use of rechargeable nickel cadmium cells although they have a voltage of only 1.25 volt while alkaline cells have 1.58 volt. So the radio has a 3.2 ohm resistance. First off we have to draw a circuit diagram. Second when using the nickel cadmium cells and each one uh, having only an internal resistance of 0.04 ohms. Uh, we got to find the uh, power. We also used to have to find the power when we are using alkaline cells which have a much higher internal resistance. So here this question, you know, we, we're trying to compare and contrast the use of lower voltage nickel cadmium cells with higher voltage alkaline cells. But what offsets the difference is that although the voltage of the nickel cadmium cells is smaller, its internal resistance is also much smaller. So when we work out this question, you can see what that means. So here is a circuit diagram. You have the cell and the in its internal resistance, and then you have the radio. So when you calculate the current, the current is going to be the voltage divided by the total resistance which is the sum of the two resistances because they are in series. So that gives us a current of 0.386 ampere. Now to calculate the power, use I squared times that resistance. Uh, we have the current, we have the resistance of the radio, so that gives 0.476 watts. That's when you use the nickel cadmium cells. But when we use the uh, alkaline cells, let's do the same thing. First we got to find the current. This time it's 1.58 divided by 3.2 plus 0.2 which is the internal resistance of the uh, alkaline cell. The current is of course much higher and then because the current is higher we see that 
the voltage delivered is also the voltage delivered is also higher 0.691 watts and then this uh, last part the d part says does this difference seem significant considering that the radius effective resistance is lowered when its volume is turned up so if the effective resistance is lowered then it's going to make a significant difference you can see the difference between the two numbers already so it is going to make a significant difference uh, whether uh, there is a difference but whether it's significant or not depends on how much the volume is turned up uh, a sure question on every exam uh, about Kirchhoff's loss so in this case we have a circuit that's given uh, we'll take this slowly this circuit has two uh, actually it has two loops a top loop right there and a bottom loop and we can also consider the outer loop and call it a third one and we are asked to calculate the currents flowing in the circuit in this figure so the currents are already labeled in the circuit and when you look at this electrical junction a see that i1 is flowing away i2 is flowing away from the junction but i3 is flowing towards and according to Kirchhoff's first law the total current flowing in must be equal to the total current flowing out which means I3 must be equal to I1 plus I2 so when that's the, the first equation on top here we see that the total resistance comes out to be uh, 25.1 ohms is that right in this branch I mean in this part it's 20 and then you have 5 and 0.1 so that's 25.1 ohms and then in this part you have 0.5 and 40 which adds up to 40.5 now the reason for this uh, you know lumping up the resistances is because I1 is the current that flows through all three of these resistances I1. Similarly, I2 is the current that flows through both of these resistances. So we can take all three of these together and these two together. And then apply Kirchhoff's second rule. And if we start from here, we're moving in the direction of the current. So we're going in the direction of the current through all of these three resistors. And if we are going in the direction of the current, we take it to be positive. So you take the current, which is I1, multiply it with the total of those resistances, which is 25.1, and consider it to be positive because we're going in the direction of the current. So that gives us 25.1 I1. And then when you come to this part and you continue going this way, you see that we're going against the current because I2 is coming in here this way while we have decided to go this way see that whenever you go opposite of the current you take the product but put a negative so that's why you have negative 40.5 now 40.5 is the sum of the resistances I2 is the current you take that product but we put a negative because we are going opposite to the flow of current. So that's why we get negative 40.5 I2. And then when you come to this battery, you come to the negative. So that's negative 24, right? And then when you hit this one, you hit the positive. So it's positive 48. Again, negative 24, because you look at which terminal you first come to it's negative here but when you come to the second one you first come to the positive negative 24 plus 48 is plus 24 so that's how you get the plus 24 is equal to zero now i've taken some time to explain that but let me do the same thing in the second loop in the second loop uh, first let's talk about the voltages 
here you have a negative it's a negative 48 and then when you come to this you hit the positive so it's plus 36 and then when you come here once again you hit the negative 6 right so if you decide to go this way we would have got that but the way I've written, you can go either way in the circuit but I think I'm going this way I can see it from there because you see this is positive 6 negative 36 positive 48 so you got 48 plus 6 54 minus 36 is 18 so I've decided to go this way that's why I get plus 18 again let me show you why I've decided to go this way so it's positive 6 minus 36 plus 48 that gives me the 18 and then you know that when we go here we're going to go just like before opposite to the flow of current and so it's negative 40.5 I2 here again you're coming opposite to this current so that's 78 and then you have 0.05 and you have 0.20 and so the total resistance is 78.25 and since you're going against it that is also negative I know you got to really look at how to get this directions and that's uh, the important part of understanding Kirchhoff's second law so that's how you get the second equation Two is equal to oh we have to solve to get those answers okay so those are the so those are the answers and I'm going to show you how to solve got to be really patient here here is the second equation that I'm writing over with a small difference I've taken the 24 to the other side making it negative 24 uh, likewise for the the other equation I'm taking 18 to the other side to make it negative 18 but I've also done something in place of I3 I have written I1 plus I2 because we know I3 is I1 plus I2 so what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get rid of the I3 here which means I will have two simultaneous equations which both have I1 and I2 which will enable me to eliminate one of them solve the other one that's what I'm doing so when I distribute the 78.25 I get two terms there one for I1 the other for I2 and then I collect these two I2 terms which will give me negative 118.75 I2 and then I'm rewriting this equation down here just to show you what I'm doing because I need to solve it and you could solve it in many ways but this is what I like to do I like to multiply the top one with 25.1 the bottom one with 70 negative 78.25 and you know why because when you multiply these two and you see that the you get the same product here this product is going to be positive 
this product is going to be negative so if you add them you will cancel them out but when you do that for that you'll have to multiply with the others too so anyways that gets rid of i1 and we will get the value of i2 so when i do it for i2 this is the total value i get negative 2980.625 i2 is 451.0 oh, i made a calculation mistake there it's corrected now so I actually get this after several mistakes sorry for that I get i2 is equal to this divided by see all I did is I missed the sign and all the numbers changed so you got to be careful got i2 as 0.379 once you get the value of I2, you can plug it into any one of the equations and get the value of I1. So obviously I've plugged it into this equation. I've plugged in the value of I2 there and I am getting the value of I1. I1 is 8.65 divided by 25.1, which is negative 0.345 ampere once you get i1 and i2 it's easy to get i3 because i3 is the sum of i1 and i2 so we get 0 0.034 ampere so that's how we work out kirchhoff's law problems with the conversion of a galvanometer into a voltmeter first so find the resistance that must be placed in series with a 25 ohm galvanometer having a 50 microampere sensitivity to allow it to be used as a eighth question it deals with the conversion of a galvanometer into a voltmeter first so find the resistance that must be placed in series with a 25 ohm galvanometer having a 50 microampere sensitivity to allow it to be used as a voltmeter with a 0.1 volt full scale reading. So I hope you've looked at the lecture video and then you know that to convert a galvanometer into a voltmeter, you connect a high resistance in series to the instrument. So here is the circuit. Uh, you connect that high resistance in series with the galvanometer to measure the required voltage and voltage is the product of current and resistance in this case you have two resistances in series so you add them up and the voltage is the current flowing through the galvanometer is I sub G so rearrange that equation to get the resistance as V by IG minus little r where little r is the resistance of the galvanometer so plug in all the numbers given you need it to measure up to this voltage this is microampere changed into ampere because one microampere is 10 to the negative 6 ampere and then minus the resistance of the galvanometer which gives 1975 ohms so when you connect a, a high resistance to a galvanometer it becomes a voltmeter put a galvanometer into an ammeter now for this a very low resistance is connected in parallel with it it's the exact opposite of what you do to change it into a voltmeter to change it into a voltmeter you connect a high resistance in series and to connect it in uh, to convert it into a ammeter you connect a very low resistance in parallel with it so here is the circuit that you get so you have this galvanometer that's connect uh, you have this resistance connected in parallel with it I is the current to be measured, IG is the current that flows through the galvanometer 
the remaining current goes through this low resistance. The lecture video explains that. So here it is. Since we know that the voltage across A and B can be written in two ways. It's either the, the product of this current multiplied by this resistance or this current multiplied by this resistance. Okay, We know because the voltage across parallel branches must be the same. You put them equal to each other. So Ig times little r must be equal to I minus Ig times caps r. And then rearrange that to get this formula. Once you get that formula, all the values are given. That's again 100 microampere multiplied by 10 because uh, that's the resistance of the galvanometer, 10 ohms. And then the required current to be measured is up to 20 ampere minus this. This, is, this would be a really an insignificant difference because it's so small. So then you get 5.0 times 10 to the negative 5 ohm. All right, so similarly, you work out this in the same way. You work it out for 100 milliampere. So the only quantity that changes in, is in place of 20, you're going to have 100 times 10 to the negative 3. 100 times 10 to the negative 3, and then you would get the answer as 1.00 times 10 to the negative 2 ohms. In this last question, uh, this is in connection with a resistance capacitance circuit. And you know that the resistance capacitance circuit has a time constant, which is the product of the resistance and the capacitance. That time constant is given as 0 0.1 microseconds. The resistance of the flash lamp, because here we, it's talking about a photographic flash, uh, that is 0 0.04 ohms during discharge. What is the size of the capacitor supplying its energy? All right, and the B part, what is the time constant for charging the capacitor if the charging resistance is 800 kilo ohms? So there are two parts in this question. So in the first part, the time constant uh, which I mentioned is the product of resistance and capacitance. Tau is the symbol for time constant. Uh, time constant is given and time constant is RC. So we can rearrange that to find the value of the capacitance. And this is microseconds. That's why it's multiplied with 10 to the negative 6 divided by the resistance 0 0.04. So you get the Capacitance as 2.50 times 10 to the negative 6 farads. Now in the B part, what is the time constant for the charging the capacitor? If the charging resistance is 800 kilo ohms. Now kilo is 10 to the power 3. So multiply that resistance with the capacitance. And we get the answer as 2.00 seconds. And I hope uh, the solution of all these problems did make sense. But remember that uh, you got to watch the lecture video, read the textbook if you have one, before you try to work out problems. Because although I'm trying to explain how to work out the problems, uh, the lecture covers a lot more of the concepts and the theoretical part. But anyways, I, I hope all this is making sense to you. So please go ahead and share this video, comment on it, like it, do anything possible so that this gets to a, a wider audience because there are a lot more students who would like to get a free help on physics. Thank you. I hope you do that. Good luck.